And now I'd like to introduce our two speakers for this evening. Our first speaker is Carrie Ann Abbott. She is the director of the Center of Comprehensive Heart Failure Care. She received her medical degree at Thomas Jefferson Medical College. She completed her residency in internal medicine and her fellowship in advanced heart failure transplantation at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. She also received her cardiology fellowship training at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Dr. Abbott is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine, Subspecialty Board of Cardiovascular Disease, and Subspecialty Echocardiography. Dr. Abbott is part of Valley Medical Group's Cardiac Services in Paramus. Our second speaker is Amanda Podolsky. She's a clinical assistant professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine, Mount Sinai. She received her medical degree from Rutgers School of Medicine. Dr. Podolsky completed her residency at Temple University and her fellowship in hematology oncology at Montefiore Medical Center. Dr. Podolsky is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Board in Hematology and Oncology. Dr. Podolsky's practice is part of the Valley Mount Sinai Comprehensive Cancer Care in Paramus. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Thank you, Liz. Um, well, we, we might as well get started. Thank you all for taking this time to learn about cancer in your heart. And this is a specialty that's new in cardiology and oncology. It's evolving all the time. We call it cardio-oncology. It's a collaboration between cardiologists and an oncology team. So we'll learn more about that today. So why do we need this specialty of cardio-oncology? Well, the main reason is, is because people who've been diagnosed with cancer are thriving. There's been such wonderful advancements in the field of oncology and people are living for very long, long times with, with cancer diagnoses and there's many diseases that are being cured. And so when people have been successfully treated for a cancer, we don't want them down the road to develop complications from the treatments or other types of, of diseases that we could prevent. So that is why we've developed this specialty so that we can keep people's hearts healthy, not only while they're receiving their cancer treatment, but afterwards as well, so that they can thrive and live long productive lives. So these are just some statistics about cancer in the heart. So. For example, 43% of testicular cancer survivors who had high blood pressure um, will have high blood pressure compared to 31% of people who've never had testicular cancer. There's a 4.7% rate of heart attack or stroke within six months of a cancer diagnosis. There's a 30% increased risk of death um, in lung cancer patients whose radiation was in the field of the heart. So that's something that the radiation oncologists pay attention to. 87% um, is the proportion of women with breast cancer who have one or more cardiovascular risk factor that we can modify and improve upon. Five is the number of hours of moderate exercise um, that before a breast cancer diagnosis is um, associated with a 40% lower likelihood of a cardiovascular event. 25% is the percent of endometrial cancer survivors diagnosed with heart disease within five to 10 years after their cancer diagnosis. And 4.5% of people who've had childhood cancers will develop heart disease before the age of 40. So these are remarkable statistics. And since we're aware of it, these are things that we can improve upon and prevent so that, um, that people will remain healthy even after they've been treated for cancer. So there's many common risk factors between cancer and cardiovascular disease. So that's why many patients are at risk of both. So depending on the type of cancer we're talking about, a patient's age and sex may be playing a role. Of course, genetics, people who have a genetic propensity to cancer may also have a genetic propensity to cardiovascular disease. And then some of the modifiable risk factors that are common 
between the two diagnoses are diabetes, obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, sedentary lifestyles, unhealthy diets, environmental exposures, different infections. Our gut microbiome is another area of active research that we're looking into. So since there are common risk factors, when you are diagnosed with either cancer or heart disease, we should be screening and we should be keeping an eye out for the other and treating it so that we can prevent long-term complications. And, you know, we, we talked about prevention um, for both types of diagnoses, both cancer and heart disease. And the good news is the ways that we prevent cardiovascular disease are ways that we can also prevent cancer. So if we are able to keep our blood pressure at goal around 120 over 80, keep our cholesterol in check, avoid being overweight or obese, eating a plant-based diet, exercising for 150 minutes per week, managing stress, avoiding tobacco, and making sure we get adequate sleep, those healthy practices will be beneficial to prevent cancer and heart disease. And if we do have a diagnosis of either cancer or heart disease, these are ways that we can manage them and keep ourselves healthy. So I had mentioned before that the cardio-oncology team is very aggressive about preventing heart disease or, or avoiding heart disease when people are getting active cancer treatment. So one very popular chemotherapeutic agent that is used commonly for many different types of cancers is a, um, a group of chemotherapies called anthracycline. So doxorubicin, for example, is in this category. And there is a small but very real risk factor of developing heart weakness or cardiomyopathy when we're exposed to this type of medication. And it does happen to occur mostly at higher doses. So the oncology team is very um, conscientious about not giving too much of this medication. If they stay below a certain threshold, the risk of getting heart weakness from this medication is rare. But even at small doses, some people are susceptible to heart weakness. So we want to pay close attention to people's hearts when we're, they're receiving anthracycline chemotherapy. So um, we, we wanna keep an eye out for this uh, heart weakness, both while people are receiving therapy and even years down the road, it's something that can afflict us. So we would wanna do periodic echocardiograms even after the cancer therapy is completed. Um, and as we talked about it, it is more prevalent at higher doses. So who's at risk for getting this chemotherapy-induced heart weakness from anthracycline therapy? So it's mainly people at the extremes of age. So people who are older or children are more at risk. Women, unfortunately, are more at risk than men. And people have underlying cardiovascular disease, such as hypertension, prior coronary disease, anybody who's had radiation to their chest in the past, or if we're combining it with other chemotherapies that can also affect the heart, such as trastuzumab or Herceptin, and then um, cyclophosphamide or Paxlitaxel, combining all those is an increased risk. As we talked about the higher doses of anthracycline that you've received, the more likely you are to get high weakness, heart weakness. So we try to avoid higher doses. And Dr. Podolsky will talk about different ways the oncology team um, implements in order to prevent weakness of the heart muscle. So in addition to the anthracycline therapies, there's um, targeted agents for mostly breast cancer, but it's used for other cancer um, cancers as well sometimes, trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Um, they're used for HER2 positive breast cancers. This is a chemotherapy that can cause heart weakness, but unlike the anthracycline chemotherapies, which can cause a permanent damage to the heart, these medicines can cause heart weakness while people are receiving this type of therapeutic agent, but once they stop receiving the medication, the heart will go back to normal. Um, it causes a stunning or a hibernation, but it doesn't cause cell death. It's reversible. And again, the risk factors are people who are over age 50, 
who are also receiving anthracycline chemotherapies, people who've had pre-existing heart disease, have an elevated body mass index or are overweight, and people with high blood pressure. So how do we prevent the heart weakness that can occur with these chemotherapeutic agents? Well, we want to do surveillance echocardiogram. So echocardiogram is an ultrasound based modality where we put some gel on, on your chest and we take pictures of the heart. And we specifically look at this one um, strengthening um, or, or way of, of measuring heart strength called global longitudinal strain. And this will show us very subtle changes in heart strength even before we would even see a change in the ejection fraction. So ejection fraction is um, each time our heart squeezes, we should eject about 55% of the blood volume per heartbeat. Um, and most of the time, before we would see any changes in that ejection fraction, we can see a very subtle change in this global longitudinal strain number. And when we see that, if we implement therapies to strengthen the heart, we can prevent the ejection fraction from declining and we can allow patients to continue to receive the life-saving chemotherapy that they need to cure their cancer. So um, we've had a lot of success initiating medications such as beta blockers like carvedilol or metoprolol or medicines like ACE inhibitors like lisinopril or enalapril to help um, prevent any decrease in heart strength. And one of my favorite parts of being on the cardio-oncology team is we really do a lot of team-based care. So the cardio-oncology cardiologists come to Luckow where the cancer um, physicians and advanced practice providers are located. And we are always talking and collaborating. For example, I was there on Monday and Dr. Podolsky and I, we got together and we chatted and we're always bouncing ideas off of each other and making sure that we're on the same page in order to keep everybody healthy. So it's been a wonderful collaboration and we have a great team of oncologists, radiation oncologists, and um, I, I just really love working with this whole team of people. So I'm gonna end my presentation here and um, Dr. Podolsky is going to um, continue where I left off. Thank you. Just give me one second to share. You can all see my screen, right? Okay. So as you know, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is reinforcing a lot of what Dr. Abbott just said, um, but to try to talk a little bit about it from a, um, an oncologist standpoint. Um, so this slide, you know, basically is a very large overview of all the different cancer treatments and how they can affect the heart. Um, it's a little busy and I'm not expecting anybody to kind of really understand all of this, um, but it was really just to kind of give you some scheme of really what we can experience um, and the the range of side effects that all these different drugs or medicines that we give for cancer can cause. So as you see here, you know, just really in this area um, where there's the possibility of affecting the heart valves of causing coronary artery disease with heart attacks and, you know, buildup of plaque. Um, of affecting the muscle or the surrounding tissue around the heart, causing heart failure, causing abnormal heart rhythms. So really all of these things can be really catastrophic to a patient if they're receiving therapy and develop these toxicities. So, you know, our goal is to kind of know what we can expect from these diseases, but then also to then be able to kind of counteract or, you know, be able to treat it accordingly. So this is a little bit of a reiteration of what was just said, but, you know, in terms of the chemotherapy and how it affects the heart. So as Dr. Abbott had mentioned, um, you know, there the drug class of drugs called anthracyclines, which includes a medicine called doxorubicin, um, you know, can really affect the heart. Um, it's something we commonly give in leukemias, lymphomas, and breast cancer. Um, so it's very important at baseline, if we are going to put a patient on this therapy, that we 
understand what their heart function is. So all patients that are going to receive these drugs will receive some type of heart evaluation, typically done with an echocardiogram, the ultrasound of the heart. Um, and as she had mentioned too, the targeted therapies like the drugs called Herceptin, those class can also affect heart. So we will also, those we continuously monitor on therapy. For the class of drugs called the anthracyclines, you know, often we're giving it in curative intent. So we only give a set dose of the drug. So typically, because it is a dose dependent side effect, um, we hope that if we're giving four doses and we cap it at a certain amount that we won't cause heart damage. Um, but it is very important to just be aware of that. Um, as an oncologist, it's also very important that we talk to patients before putting them on these drugs and really make sure that they're fully aware that, of the risks involved, right? We don't want to just suddenly start a drug and cause them to develop heart failure. It should never be a surprise um, if something does happen, but we hope that we have all the different measures in place to kind of mitigate any risks that we see. Um, so in terms of kind of more of an overview, um, you know, as we said, that chemotherapy can affect the heart. And typically, if you do develop problems from the heart, that can affect the amount of chemo that you can receive, right? So oftentimes, we'll have to reduce the dose of drugs because of, you know, you've developed cardiac toxicities. If you do develop heart failure or heart problems, that can affect your quality of life. And it's very important that when we give treatment with curative intent, right? So we are treating breast cancer and we're giving chemotherapy, but the person should hopefully live 30, 40 years that we don't want them to develop a life-threatening illness that is related to their heart. Um, so it's really important that we keep this in mind when we're treating patients. And in rare cases, you can have death from the treatment that we're giving due to the heart toxicities. So when we are treating patients with different chemotherapy agents and drugs that can cause heart problems, it's important that we keep an eye on symptoms that a patient might present with. So what do those include? You know, somebody might say they have chest pain and we have to make sure we evaluate that appropriately. Shortness of breath can be seen. Um, if somebody's really just saying that they're tired, especially in like a young woman that has significant fatigue or just un inability to kind of do everything they normally would, you might attribute that to chemo, but a lot of times it actually is related to the heart. Um, they may develop increased swelling in their legs or their feet and due to fluid accumulation from their heart not working as well. Um, sometimes feeling dizzy or lightheaded can also be some indication of a heart abnormality, in particular cardiac um, arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythm. So again, this is reinforcing a little bit what from that first slide that I had showed you, that whole diagram of all the different possibilities of heart damage or heart disease that we can see. So the main things that we like to think about are really heart failure, which those were sort of those first drugs that we mentioned that really can affect the pumping function of the heart. Um, coronary artery disease, including heart attacks. So we really want to make sure that we do everything in our power to, to minimize those risks. Um, abnormal heart rhythms can be seen, damage to the heart valves. Um, periodically, there can be problems with the pericardium, which are, you know, there's the outer membrane of the heart. Um, and that can include pericarditis, which is more, you know, a lot of swelling around, thickening, scarring, pericardial fibrosis. And I'll go through some of the treatments that can potentially cause that. In addition, so one of the newer types of therapy that is used in cancer in general um, is immunotherapy, which is essentially using targeted therapy that causes your own body's immune system to fight cancer. Typically, when we talk about these drugs, which are used commonly in lung cancer, melanoma, um, breast cancer, we're using it more and more, bladder cancer, renal cell. Um, you know, a lot of times we think of these drugs as being pretty benign and not causing a lot of bad side effects, but there's always that few percent or very low percentage of patients that can develop side effects from these drugs. And it's important to just be aware of these things. Um, in general, when we think of immunotherapy, we think of it as causing inflammation in different organs in the body when it can cause side effects. So one of those risks is inflammation of myocarditis or inflammation by the heart. Um, so as we see here in a healthy heart, you know, your normal heart muscle, but here the muscle gets very inflamed. Most cases tend to occur within six months of starting treatment. Um, like the other slide I had showed you in terms of symptoms, you could have shortness of breath, feeling tired, chest pain, palpitations. Um, leg swelling is commonly seen. You might have some abnormal lung sounds because there's fluid accumulation in the heart. So it can sound like crackles. Um, and then it's important to look at different lab findings too. So elevated troponin, which can indicate heart damage or a BNP, which often indicates fluid overload. 
So again, a lot of times it's just really important to be cognizant of these possible side effects um, because a lot of times you can just dismiss side effects as being nothing when in reality it can be more life-threatening. So, you know, what can we do to try to help reduce the risk of heart, you know, heart problems from treatment? So oftentimes, let's say we know a patient at baseline doesn't have a healthy heart, you would aim to potentially give a different drug to those patients, right? There are plenty of chemotherapy drugs that do not have a high percentage of or chance that they're going to cause problems with the heart, right? So you want to try to minimize, you know, exposure to drugs that can cause effects on the heart if others alternatives exist that will not compromise cancer-specific outcomes. So that's very important to really be aware of that part. We don't want to affect somebody's survival from their cancer, right? So if there really isn't another drug besides an anthracycline, right, that we can give, for example, in breast cancer or something like that, we will give these drugs, but in a very cautious way, right? We don't want to make it that a patient's cancer is going to come back because we couldn't give them the most effective therapy. However, if they are starting to develop side effects or problems from the heart, then it's really important to think of what else can be given. Oftentimes, we'll reduce the dose of the drug or give other formulations of the drug. So the anthracyclines, you know, as we said, the common drug is doxorubicin. We can give it in a formulation called liposomal doxorubicin, um, which is the way that the drug is constructed is different, and it tends to have less side effects on the heart. So again, it's not necessarily standard of care for certain types of cancers, but it is very important that we think about that, um, especially in somebody who's at increased risk. Um, again, with the anthracyclines, there's, we often can give different drugs to kind of help protect the heart. So there is a drug called de dexroxoxane, sorry, um, that can help reduce heart damage. It's an injection that can be given. Typically, it's done in somebody who develops heart damage from it. It's not just something we give routinely, um, but it's just something to be aware that we know we have it as an option so should toxicities develop. So as Dr. Abbott, she focused much more on, but in terms of what can we do to kind of upfront prevent heart, you know, heart failure or other things. Really, there's not the best established strategy that everybody follows, right? It's not like one shot for everyone. Um, but I think in high and very high risk patients, like she had mentioned, use of drugs like beta blockers, like she said, metoprolol or carvedilol or ACE inhibitors or angiotensin inhibitors, they can be beneficial at, you know, protecting the heart and really making sure that more heart damage is not caused. The use of statins, which are, you know, used to lower cholesterol and potentially decrease cardiovascular risk is a little less clear. And there really needs to be a lot more studies that are trying to look into what can be done for primary prevention and, and trying to, you know, be aware of these things beforehand so that somebody never develops heart problems in the first place. So kind of, you know, switching gears a little bit, because I know we've spoken a lot about the chemotherapies and the different treatments that we give, you know, for, for cancers, you know, one of the other big treatments in the cancer world that can potentially cause heart damage is radiation. Right. Um, you know, depending on where the radiation is given, what type of cancer, the risks can be less. Um, but it's important that we kind of be aware of these things and what can be done to, to try to mitigate the risk. So up front, um, it is helpful to kind of look at people's risk factors. Right. So knowing does somebody smoke, does somebody have underlying high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary artery calcifications? And sometimes being aware of these risks beforehand, again, we can try to help mitigate risks going forward. Um, there are newer techniques that minimize the dose of the radiation to the heart, and I'll go through some of that with you as well. Um, looking um, coronary artery calcification screening, which, you know, are usually a CAT scans that can look at um, calcification buildup. So kind of giving you a baseline of what your heart function is. So it looks at your atherosclerotic burden. Um, and if you look at it before doing radiation, you can kind of get an idea of who's at higher risk for developing heart damage from the radiation. So while it's not necessarily a routine part of care, it is something that maybe more and more should be looked at before radiation to try to help, uh, again, better assess who might develop heart damage later on. And then again, surveillance, um, there's not the best modality for that, but I will go through some, you know, proposed mechanisms for surveillance. And then again, trying to image the heart with whether it be coronary artery calcifications or echocardiograms after radiation to, to try to help balance that. Um, 
So in terms of in breast cancer, right? So especially if you're thinking of right-sided breast cancer, that you're going to get radiation to your right breast, your heart is right under there, right? I'm sorry, I said right, I meant to say left. Um, your heart is there. Um, and, you know, we want to try to help minimize the amount of radiation that your heart is exposed to. So this image here sort of shows um, the amount of radiation that your heart was exposed to over time, right? So more and more radiation has become a lot more nuanced. Um, and there are a lot of different techniques to really help minimize the amount of heart that is exposed to radiation that is given for something other than the heart, right? So, you know, in the old days before the 90s, um, when they, these old planning techniques, there was really very little that they could do to, to minimize exposure. In the early 2000s, you know, when they started doing CT planning, again, they can image the heart and they can kind of get a better idea of how much radiation can be exposed. Um, but now, really, in more recent years, with the advanced CT planning, um, so in breast cancer, a lot of times we'll have a patient lie on their stomach during radiation. So again, they can kind of, their breast can be going forward and it minimizes the amount that of the radiation that the heart is receiving, right? They use deep inspiration. So you take a deep breath when you receive the radiation and I'll go through that. And again, that can minimize the amount of radiation that the heart is seeing um, using different dosing techniques. Um, and really, as you see, even just in these two images here, here, your heart is included in the field of radiation where here it really isn't. So we want to do our best to try to minimize how much the heart sees the radiation so that future problems don't arise. So as I had mentioned before, um, in terms of using different breathing techniques during radiation, again, this is really specific to radiation for the breast, um, where this deep inspiration, you know, it moves the heart inferiorly and posteriorly away from the radiation beams, right? And so there's shown, as you see even in this picture, right, when you're taking these deep breaths where the heart is moved away, this field here is the radiation field and it's not getting, the heart is getting very, very minimal exposure, if at all, right? Um, and it can be used in intensity modulated therapy. So when they're increasing the doses of radiation, it can still be used from that. Um, and it's really shown to decrease the amount of heart and the, you know, art arterial exposure um, to radiation. So like I had mentioned before, in terms of surveillance or what are our, you know, how do we measure who's at risk or what going forward will develop heart problems? Um, so this is a nice proposed plan of survivorship after radiation. And again, it really depends where in your body you receive radiation, right? So if you had gotten radiation to your head and neck for, you know, tongue cancer, or other cancers in that region, right? So there, you're not really worried about your heart damage but you're more worried about your arteries in the neck that maybe there's going to be, you know, carotid plaque builds up from that, right? Versus if you get radiation to your abdomen or your pelvis, there we might be more concerned about your lower extremity vascular, you know, the your vascular exam there and getting peripheral artery disease and things like that. So, and when you get radiation to the lungs or the breast, that's really where we care a lot more about the cardiac exam. So the way that this is sort of presenting, you know, the exam is to at baseline get, you know, cardiac history from a patient, get their physical exam, review available imaging. And like we had said, maybe getting a, a CT coronary scan um, to evaluate what their atherosclerotic risk is. Optimizing their cardiovascular risk factors. So again, minimizing smoking, they're checking their blood pressure, diabetes, um, and using different techniques like we had mentioned to minimize um, the exposure to the heart at baseline checking their cardiac rhythm and their by an EKG and again, their, their potential risk for coronary um, atherosclerotic disease and an echocardiogram. And then the way it's presenting in an annual basis is again, to kind of review available imaging, optimizing risk factors, and then depending on the type area that was exposed to radiation, deciding how to evaluate, right? So if you had head and neck radiation, doing ultrasounds of your carotid artery can be done maybe on an annual basis. Um, in somebody who got radiation to their chest area, there you will want to check their blood pressures in both arms. You want to look for signs of maybe blockage. You want to do echocardiograms and really looking for ischemic heart disease. And like I had said before, in people who have radiation to their abdomen and pelvis, it's looking at their vascular exam, their pulse is there. Symptoms for blockage, you also want to make sure that their kidneys are functioning well and don't have any blockages as well. 
So I think this is a nice kind of idea or scheme to think about in somebody who's gotten radiation to different areas. Um, so kind of taking a step away from radiation, um, you know, just in general, kind of reinforcing again what Dr. Abbott had said, you know, it's important to look at cardiometabolic comorbidities in cancer in patients and survivors, right? So as we had mentioned, patients are living longer and longer, right? So we want to kind of very much manage people's different heart risk factors, um, both during but also after their cancer therapy, right? So I have a lot of patients who I will see 10 years out from their cancer diagnosis, right? And you want to make sure that while they may live from their cancer, that they're not developing heart disease later on, potentially secondary to the chemotherapy or maybe anti-estrogen therapy that they received during their breast cancer treatment. Um, so as this you know, image kind of shows us that the different, you can kind of assess different risk factors in each patient, right? It, this And this can be a multitude of different things that come into play together. So somebody's genetics, sometimes their lifestyle behaviors, right? So their diet, are they exercising, their environment, you know, and is there smoking, different things. There are social determinants of health too. You know, what are their exposures to, you know, facilities or to, to doctors really to be able to get proper medical care. Um, and then the actual cardiovascular risk disease, or they do they have diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of these things together can increase somebody's risk of heart disease and, and both morbidity and mortality from heart disease. So it's important to kind of look, look at all these things on a regular basis and assess who we think needs additional treatment. There was a study last year um, in the American College of Cardiology that showed that adult cancer survivors, so people, again, who have lived their cured of their cancer, that they had about 42% greater risk of cardiovascular disease than those without cancer. So it really shows that the cancer treatment itself will increase their risk, that having cancer itself might increase their risk. So we really need to do our best to try to mitigate their, this risk. Um, and just, again, reinforcing what was said before, um, it, it really is important that the, the way that we go about treating and minimizing heart disease in these patients is a team-based approach, right? We want to optimize both what we're be able to give for the cancer and the non-cancer therapy. Um, and as Dr. Abbott said, our cardio-oncology program is really, really important. Um, I know I send a lot of patients there um, where both if, in the prevention setting, but also some people who will develop things and how to approach making sure that no further damage is done, right? It's important that we look at the blood pressure, the cholesterol, diabetes after cancer, um, is diagnosed to help limit more severe side effects. And like I said, these cardio-oncology clinics can both help with cancer therapy and cardiovascular health. Um, this is, um, you know, from the European Society of Cardiology, I thought another nice scheme of kind of what can be done in these cardio-oncology clinics, but more also in these survivorship clinics, right? So somebody has a new cancer treatment, you know, it's important that you kind of get a baseline assessment of their cardiac risks, right? And they can be potentially stratified into low, moderate, and high risk. And then during cancer treatment, you know, you kind of, again, have to advise and support patients to promote healthy lifestyle. You look at their cardiovascular risk factors and cardiovascular disease. Um, you, you know, and so in somebody who's low risk, just doing regular surveillance that they would normally see, whether it be by their primary cardiologist is important. If somebody is a, thought to be a little bit more high risk, whether they're moderate or high, is really making sure that they see a cardiologist and not pushing that off where then they develop cardiac complications in the long run, right? I could tell you that I have a patient now who's in the hospital who had pre-existing heart disease. She, she was in her 70s when diagnosed with cancer, but had never seen a doctor since she was a child, right? And so she had significant coronary disease that probably went underdiagnosed for a very long time. And before starting one of the therapies, we had found it, you know, she still knew about it, but was reluctant to do treatment. And now, unfortunately, has worsening of her heart failure. Um, but this potentially could have been avoided had she been better about going to the doctor when she was encouraged to do so. Um, so it is very important that these patients be identified to try to help minimize these risks. Um, again, as this scheme shows, you know, then what do you do at the first year after cancer therapy? you know, make these assessments. And then long-term follow-up is really regularly checking, whether it be with echocardiograms, whether it be looking at their risk factors and assessing for new symptoms. And it's just very important to just be aware of these things so that heart disease does not develop. And lastly, um, you know, I think it's, it's just something to just be aware of that there really are 
health disparities um, that we see um, where racial and ethnic minorities with existing disparities in heart outcomes, they, they can have a much higher burden of cardiac complications both during and after cancer treatment. This is in part due to the inequities in the management of the cardiovascular risk factors. So it might be that the facility that some of these patients are going to do not have a cardio-oncology clinic or they don't have the means to provide appropriate cardiac care to these patients. Um, we know that African-Americans have a higher rate of high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart complications when compared to non-minority groups. And women, African-American women with breast cancer have the poorest cancer specific and overall survival. So, and when we're saying overall survival, it's not, you know, that they're also not surviving from their cancer, right? They're having issues with heart complications. So a lot of times this is due to, you know, access problems with access to care, whether they live in different places, but it's just very important that we keep this in mind and that these patients do not fall under, you know, observation or that they don't get detected in the appropriate way. And with that, I'm going to conclude and kind of transition to questions. Thank you both so much. Um, very comprehensive information. Um, I'd just like to remind the participants, if you have any questions at this time, you could submit them using the Q&A portal at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we'll give folks a minute to um, let some questions come in. And Okay, for someone who um, is a cancer survivor, a long time cancer survivor, if they have or have not been regularly seeing a physician, what should they do? Should they should they see their oncologist who was who treated them in the past? Should they see their primary care? You mentioned the cardio oncology team. Can they reach out to them? Can you explain that a little, what the process would be? I guess I can start. Um, <laughs> um, so I think a lot of times it probably makes, it sort of depends how they, what they're feeling and sort of what symptoms are um, and how far out they are from their cancer diagnosis. Um, you know, I would say if it's been 10 years and they haven't seen an oncologist, probably seeing a primary care doctor would be the appropriate place to start there and can be then referred to cardio oncology or other things like that. Um, typically, you know, if they, let's say are within a sh shorter window of their cancer diagnosis, you know, I would say seeing the oncologist is appropriate. Um, and then we can make the assessment of whether seeing cardio oncology or just really seeing even just a cardiology team in general doesn't necessarily need to be our specific clinic for that would be kind of the appropriate way to go about it. Thank you, um, Dr. Podolsky. I'd also like to add that people who've had childhood cancers are particularly at risk of cardiac complications down the road. So these are people that, you know, maybe survived their cancers and, and were doing well for a long period of time. But they could develop symptoms of heart disease at younger ages than most people develop heart disease. So they need to keep their eyes out for any signs of shortness of breath, chest pain, fatigue, lightheadedness, dizziness, anything like that. And then certainly present to their primary doctor or their, you know, the, their cardiologist or, or get a referral because it's important that we evaluate that and take that seriously. Thank you. That was actually going to, to be my next question was about um, what signs and symptoms should someone be um, looking for. So thank you. That was uh, great. I was just curious in terms of research that's being done um, either for um, the type of chemotherapies that are, are they looking at different types of chemotherapies or is it more the heart protective elements or is there something coming down the pike that that you've heard or read? Um, so they're obviously always looking for new treatments um, and the less cardiotoxic, the better. Um, I think 
you know, like the, the anthracyclines, those drugs that we had mentioned, and that's a very old class of chemotherapy. Unfortunately, despite it being very old and being around for a very long time, it's still one of the most effective for certain types of cancer. So we know that it affects the heart, but it's still given for a lot of things. Um, I would say that all the newer therapies, I know I spoke about immunotherapy causing the myocarditis, but you know, that's a pretty rare side effect. Um, and a lot of the more targeted therapies have a lot lower risk of heart disease. Um, but it really depends on the type of cancer too. Um, you know, as Dr. Abbott had said with the HER2, you know, the breast cancers that all of those agents, unfortunately, even all of these newer and evolved agents have this potential risk of affecting the heart. So despite there being huge waves of research and new data that are kind of giving us new therapies, there still is this possibility of heart disease. So it's just important that we keep that in mind. And also, I, I like to add that there are revolutionary new cancer therapies coming out all the time, which is wonderful. They're targeted and they're really, um, you know, making huge impacts in the cancer world. But every medication we prescribe has side effects. And so that's why it's important that we um, that we do long term studies on people getting these medicines because we find out that um, down the road, you know, that that new new side effect profiles emerge. So, for example, the the a cancer therapy we use for lung cancer a lot called Avastin that there's a, a very high chance of getting high blood pressure with that. So we just need to be aware of it and treat it aggressively if it is to occur. Um, and as long as we know what the potential side effects are and we're watching people closely, we usually could manage it or mitigate it and allow people to get these life-saving medicines. Thank you both so much. 